Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and over the years, um, particularly in the last couple of years, I've been getting a number of requests from different people to start doing some Sony-specific reviews. And, um, you know, I've, as many of you know, I've, I'm pretty invested in the Canon ecosystem, and, and so I, I didn't really have anything outside of that system. And so I did open up, and at one point I and ran a GoFundMe to help towards the goals to get an A7R2 to uh, do Sony-specific reviews on. Uh, I didn't really get an overwhelming response to that GoFundMe, but there, was, there were some of you that contributed towards that. And so while I didn't end up purchasing an A7R2, in fact, there was only about 100 bucks that came in, but I did go ahead and purchase because I needed a mirrorless in my kit. I purchased a A6500. And so um, I had uh, taken a look at the A6300 and didn't do a review at it, but kind of um, I strongly considered it back a year or so ago. But there were a few things that was still lacking that I was looking for. And I understand that the A6500 is just a bit of a, you know, kind of a A6300 2.0, so to speak, in that it is essentially the same camera with some significant improvements, but I, uh, I just felt like those kind of things pushed it over the edge, and so it was something that I wanted to try out. So, of course, when you go into a completely different camera system, you start from scratch, and while I have picked up the Sigma MC11, you know, to help to adapt some lenses to it, I basically was looking at having a camera body without any lenses to put on it. So, anyway, I was I was in the midst of a conversation with some of my friends at Zeiss and um, at Zeiss USA. They were super kind enough to loan me the Zeiss Tuit line, which is specifically designed for, um, for Sony mirrorless and, uh, and specifically in this e-mount for APS-C e-mount, which of course the A6500 is an APS-C body. And so I just want to first give a big shout out, a big thank you to the awesome people at Zeiss USA for um, you know just being very considerate and loaning them to me. It's also given me an opportunity to evaluate the three lenses that currently exist in the Tuit line. And so that's what I'm here to begin discussing here today. And these will be the first of the reviews that I'm doing on the A6500 and just taking a look at these uh, particular lenses. So as of today, um, in 2017, there are currently three lenses in the series. There is a 32mm f1.8, there is a 12mm f2.8, and then a 50mm macro planar um, uh, f2.8 lens. And so I've now been using these lenses for about a month uh, at this point and taken a lot of different photos with them. And of course, being the only uh, lenses that I really had for this camera body, I've uh, spent a lot of time with them in particular. And so what I'm going to be doing in a, a two-part series here is kind of breaking down the attributes of each one of them and hopefully doing some positioning in the marketplace. Now, I want to kind of right off the beginning... Uh, you know, discuss what has been one of the, the major negatives that um, reviewers in past years have assigned and remains an issue if you have something other than uh, an A6500, basically. A6500 being the first of Sony's mirrorless to have the five-axis in-body image stabilization built into it, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why I was, I was quite intrigued by the camera. And so one of the negatives that they have, they have been knocked for is, of course, the lack of built-in OSS or optical uh, steady shot image stabilization built into them. That, of course, has become a non-issue if you have a Sony A6500. And so I've been able to, you know, kind of have the advantage of using these lenses with image stabilization. However, I will note that there is both a blessing and a curse that is associated with that. And so let me just jump into that real quick to delineate that before we go any further. That is that if you neglect to turn off the steady shot in the camera, that these lenses, it really causes them to do, and particularly this is for video use, it will cause them to do a lot of extra kind of pulsing and hunting in and out. And I, I kind of learned this the hard way in trying to video a few segments, which I shot on the A6500, in which I was really dealing with a pulse issue. And I discovered that it was, uh, at least in large part, because I had neglected to turn the steady shot, the 
five axis in body image stabilization off in the camera. And so that was, uh, you know, just kind of actually creating a bit of movement that was kind of feeding into that while on a tripod. And so anyway, that's just something to understand that, of course, it's wonderful to have the image stabilization, but just note that if you're shooting video on a tripod, you need to disable the, if you're shooting with an A6500, disable that in-body image stabilization. So, of course, the first reaction that I had in looking at these lenses when they were delivered to me is, of course, that they have the, the beautiful Zeiss design except for in miniature form. And I looked at them and thought, wow. You know, it's not often that I look at lenses and say, wow, that's cute. But in this case, because I'm a fan of Zeiss lenses anyway, to see them kind of miniaturized, most Zeiss lenses that I use are, well, they're somewhat massive. And so to see uh, kind of that familiar profile, the look and the, you know, the little tiny blue Zeiss badge there, in such small form, I, you know, of course, thought of them as being very cute. But beyond being cute, let's take a little bit closer look at the build and the design of these lenses and highlight some strengths and weaknesses. Okay, we'll start out by just giving you a quick look at the packaging of these lenses, which they do come out. Uh, they really are beautifully packaged. And the presentation, by the way, is the exact same as it is for the very high-end Otis or Milvis series. It comes in a custom molded case for it. And so it's designed for this lens. And, and so then you have some documentation in this pocket here. And so a really, really nice uh, case in terms of the presentation there. However, there is no carrying case lens pouch or lens case that is included outside of that. So what we'll do is we'll go through quickly and detail each of the uh, three lenses from the widest to the longest telephoto. So all of them are similar in construction, and so we'll just cover the basic construction here. They are metal body, as Zeiss lenses tend to be, a rubberized focus ring, and this lens here, this has been you know, used by reviewers for years now, and so it's got you know, a little bit of wear on the body that you know, some of that will probably just clean right off, but anyway, um, it, it's held up just fine. Some people have been concerned about these rubberized focus rings and you know saying they're going to decay and fall apart um, I, I frankly I haven't seen any evidence of that personally and and so I mean I could be wrong but I've been looking at Zeiss lenses since they've made the switch and I've yet to see any evidence of any kind of wearing or peeling on that the lens mount on these is metal, of course, but there is no weather sealing on the series, and that's an omission that I miss for sure. And uh, towards the front, of course, all of these have Zeiss's T-Star coatings, which are, frankly, they're some of the best in the business. Um, and Zeiss has been working for a long time and perfecting those. So now as we go a little bit more specifically on this lens, looking at the front, this is a Disticon optical formula, and it is 11 elements in eight groups, 67 millimeter front filter thread. So that's definitely the largest of the bunch. And uh, it comes with a pedal shaped lens hood that, you know, as you can see is, it's good sized, but um, it does a good job of shading the front uh, element there. And of course, one thing I do like about all of these Zeiss designs here is that the lens hood is purposely designed to complete the profile of the lens. Now, one difference is, is that here with the Batiste line and then also with the Tuit line, that while the body is metal, the lens hood itself is plastic, which is undoubtedly a weight saving measure uh, to help it to balance better on these small mirrorless bodies. It is a quality plastic, however, good and thick, and I'm sure it will hold up just fine. Looking a little bit further at the lens itself, this, of course, is the, the widest around of this series because of the flare towards the front as a wide-angle lens. In terms of its overall length, it is right under 3.2 inches or 81 millimeters. It weighs in at 9.17 ounces or 260 grams. All of these have nine rounded aperture blades, no image stabilization. However, there is autofocus. This particular lens uh, can focus down to 7.09 inches or 18 centimeters, and that is a you know, fairly poor reproduction ratio of one to nine. Mounted on the camera body itself, this is a Sony a6500. You can see that, you know, while obviously it's pretty big towards the front, in terms of the balance, the balance is just fine. It's a nice and lightweight and works well there. This lens retails for $999 in the U.S. market. 
Secondly, we have the 32 millimeter f1.8. So as an f1.8 lens, it has a wider maximum aperture than a lot of the competing lenses. And so that's one area that it is set apart. It has a 52 millimeter front filter thread, which it shares with the 50 millimeter macro planar lens. And of course, this is a planar optical design, fairly simple, eight elements in five groups. It also, uh, it also has a 1 to 9 reproduction ratio. That's about 0 0.11 or 0 0.12. Not all that fantastic. It can focus down to 1.21 feet or 37 centimeters. So the... Uh, the 12 millimeter has an angle of view um, with the crop factor applied here, 1.5 times on either a Sony E or a Fuji X, which they are made for. And, and so, um, that is, so that makes this an 18 millimeter full frame equivalent, you know, right in the sweet spot for landscape. In this case, you have almost an exact normal. It is a, that's 48 millimeters equivalent. And, and so, um, you know, makes it a, a very versatile lens. This is a focal length that I actually really like here. Now, looking a little bit more at the physical characteristics of the lens, this is the smallest, most compact of the series. It only weighs a little over seven ounces or 200 grams, very light, and uh, it is under three inches, 2.83 inches or 72 millimeters long. Mounted on uh, the uh, A6500 body, it is obviously very small, very compact. It also comes with the lens hood, not pedal shaped here, and, and so that completes the profile of it uh, here. Final lens in the series here is the Macro Planar 50mm f2.8. And so this, of course, has an equivalent field of view of 75mm compared to on full frame. And um, it comes in at also $999. I should mention that the 32 millimeter is the cheapest of the series at $720. So uh, same things to note here. One thing that I will kind of note, particularly because I particularly miss it on a macro lens. All of these are focused by wire, and I'll detail what that means a little bit more in just a second. But as a result, of course, there are no switches on the body, you know, nothing other than the focus ring, but there's no distance window. And so that means that if you're wanting to manually focus, you basically just have to look at the input on uh, the, you know, LCD screen or in the viewfinder, but there isn't any kind of, you know, visible physical readout here. And that's something, of course, that Zeiss solved creatively with the Batiste series by putting the OLED on it. So uh, same kind of physical attributes here. Uh, the lens hood is actually identical. It, it, physically, it's identical to the 1.832. You can see that it could it's kind of be, be used on either one of them. And so um, the body itself of this lens, of course, metal. It also has a 52 millimeter front filter thread. This is the most uh, optically complex of the series, 14 elements in 11 groups. And it's important to note that this can focus down to 6.02 inches or just 14, or excuse me, 15.29 centimeters, which um, means that basically, and I just want to kind of clarify how that works for you here because that's not, you know, from here. If you'll see on the top of any one of your cameras, you'll see a mark something like this somewhere. That actually shows where the sensor is. And so um, you're actually measuring that six inches from the sensor. And so basically, if you have the lens hood attached here, you, you are pretty much right on top of your subject um, at minimum focus distance. Now this is a true one-to-one -one um, full life size, full macro lens. And so it actually best the macro planar series for full frame uh, in that they are just a one to two or half size uh, magnification, 0 0.50. And so it's actually, um, you know, it, it's a more versatile um, macro lens than that. But just no image stabilization on this either. And uh, it is the longest and heaviest of the series. It is 4.5. 0.8 inches or 104 millimeters and it weighs in at 10.23 ounces or 290 grams and so once again it's still very lightweight balances nicely and it works really well on the sony a6500 i'm testing it on so of course as per usual you can see that they are beautifully designed you know a lot of metal in the construction as is typical 
But at the same time, there are a couple of omissions if you're looking at, say, compared to the Batiste line or if you're looking at, you know, your Milvis line for uh, DSLRs. And of course, that first kind of omission is the fact that you are dealing with no weather sealing on these lenses. And, you know, in the case of using a, like A6300, A6500, these lenses or these bodies do have some degree of weather sealing in them. And so, unfortunately, you know, that may makes them not as perfect a match as they could be if they did have some weather sealing. And of course, to be fair, you know, a lot of the lenses that they're competing with also don't have weather sealing, but that's just something I, I noted as an omission. The other thing to note is that because of the design of these lenses, of course, they are unlike uh, most Zeiss lenses that I review for, um, you know, for DSLRs, these are auto-focusing lenses. And, uh, and so the only other autofocusing Zeiss lens that I've used is I did do a review of the new uh, Batiste 135 f2.8 lens on an A7R2 body. But in this case, the fact that they, because they are designed for mirrorless and the autofocus system inside is, is, it is somewhat akin to, for me as a Canon shooter, it's somewhat akin to STM technology, to where it is a focus by wire system. So in other words, while it does have that, you know, that beautifully, you know, kind of damp, and it still feels, feels good-ish, um, it's that rubberized surface, and so it's a very nice focus ring, but unlike in DSLRs, it's not that perfectly weighted, damped, and of course, you know, just amazing finite manual focus control. This is a focus by wire, which means that the actual manual focus, it is, it takes input from the focus ring, it runs it through the, the input, through the camera body and through the focus motor. And, and so it's actually still the focus mo motor that actually moves things. Now that being said, the focus action is still better than, you know, I'm mostly familiar with um, Canon's mirrorless lenses or lenses designed for Canon's, you know, EOS M system. So I will say that it is, the focus action is better than most of those lenses, but there still is that basic lag issue where you focus and, you know, and you make a movement and there is a, a slight bit of lag in between. The other thing is, is that compared to some of the other lenses that I've now used, um, you know, a, one of Sony's own lenses, the 55 to 210, and I've also started to use, and I'll be looking at those soon. That's kind of the next stage. I'm looking at all of the Sigma DN lenses designed for um, Sony mirrorless. But compared to those, the autofocus motor is um, has a little bit more sound to it. You can hear a little bit more focus, and that is true in particular if you're doing video. One of the things that I will point out about autofocus is that of these three lenses, my favorite when it comes to autofocus is actually the macro planar 50 millimeter f2.8. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it just seems to focus more confidently. It has less pulsing. And, and also I find that it works a lot better um, when I'm shooting in, you know, like an AFC, continuous autofocus mode. The autofocus is actually really, really good and quite accurate. And I was able to, I was shocked at how well I could track action with that combination, particularly considering that all of my previous mirrorless experience has been with the EOS M system, which that has been traditionally a weak point for it. And so um, I, I shot quite a bit of an event work using this lens. And it really did a fantastic job in um, AFC mode and then kind of my personal default mode for just steady or just kind of everyday shooting is I, I do like using the DMF or direct manual focus because that just means that if I want to manually focus override, I can just immediately do so and instantly get that magnification in the viewfinder, which by the way, um, the A6500 is fantastic as is the a7r2 for actually doing manual focus on and so anyway those are some of the the strengths of these now if you as far as using the the 32 millimeter f1.8 or the 12 millimeter excuse me the 12 millimeter f2.8 if you use those in afc mode they just tend to do uh, more pulsing than what the other the 50 millimeter f2.8 does and so that is a couple of things to consider. And so just to quickly recap, these are beautifully designed and made lenses with, you know, a, definitely a Zeiss grade build. 
though without the weather sealing of the Milvis line. And of course, they do have autofocus, but they don't have um, any kind of optical stabilization as a part of them. They're also, you know, in, in Zeiss tradition, they are also on the, the more expensive end of the spectrum, although not incredibly so. And so the, uh, the 12 millimeter and the 50 millimeter both come in at $999. And then the 32 millimeter F1.8 is a little less expensive. Um, right now at B&H Photo, it's $720 for it. And so anyway, they're, you know, they're not inexpensive, but they are beautifully made and, um, you know, very functional lenses. But of them, I think that I, I've gotten the most bang for the buck out of the 50 millimeter f2.8. In our next segment, we'll take a closer look at the image quality from these, and I'll give you a final verdict on um, what I think of them at this point, and also, of course, share a lot of images with you. And if you um, if you'd like to look in the description down below, you can see the image gallery that I have um, created, and with each one of these lenses represented there, photos from each one of them. And so, take a look there, and and I think that you'll enjoy what you see. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you haven't already, you can follow me on social media, and or you can help to fund future reviews and expanding what I'm able to do by becoming one of my patrons at my Patreon account. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.